I will be your host today. My name is Sylvia Kelly, and I am the country representative for the eHealth Africa office here in Sierra Leone. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Insights is a public health webinar series hosted by eHealth Africa with the purpose of fostering conversations with professionals and all stakeholders within the public health space. Today, I have the great honor of hosting our discussion on sustainable energy for improved healthcare delivery in primary healthcare centers. When it comes to the delivery of quality healthcare, the vital role played by reliable and affordable energy remains somewhat understated. From emergency care, diagnostics, and vaccine refrigeration, to communications and record keeping, electricity is indispensable to modern medical services. Yet hundreds of millions of people around the world are forced to rely on healthcare facilities that operate without power. As we all know, access to electricity is an essential requirement for improving health and well being. However, evidence about energy access in healthcare facilities in developing countries is lacking. In 2012, the United Nations under UN Sec, also known as the SE for All Initiative, which aims to achieve universal access to clean and modern energy sources in households and other community settings by 2030. This initiative also aims to double the global rate of energy efficiency and use of renewable energy. To help us dig deeper into this important topic, we have an interesting array of panelists today. And I will introduce each of our panelists alphabetically by first name. And if I can have each of my panelists as, we, as I introduce you come in and say a hello to our audience today, that would be great. First on our panelists, we have Frankie Eckersley Carr, who is the GIS and Software Tools Consultant for the Integration Consulting Group. Frankie is a mechanical engineer and expert in the field of GIS-based remote planning for distributed renewable energy systems. She has been working extensively since 2014 in the development of innovative approaches for the identification and design of mini grid projects. Can I ask everyone to please mute their mics? Judith, your mic is on. Yes. Thank you. Um, back to Frankie. She leads a team in development of GIS-based algorithms and methodologies for the development of the Nigeria SE for All web apps of geospatial data on electricity grids and rural semi-urban settlements. Take, please join me in welcoming Frankie. Thank you, Frankie. You can come on and let us see your beautiful face today. Hi, thank you everyone. It's great to be here and thanks for uh, inviting me as well, eHealth Africa. Very well. Next, we have our very own Mohamed Bello. He is a project manager here at eHealth Africa. Mohamed is a PRINCE2 and PMD Pro Certified Project Manager with eHealth Africa. He is a seasoned implementation professional with a decade of experience in public health and operations, business development and research. He managed several health system strengthening projects, including energy-related projects in Nigeria, like the Energy Mapping Health Facility Survey Project, alongside integration. As part of the Nigeria Energy Support Program, covering over 600 selected health facilities across three states, he has published five articles in the area of development and health system strengthening. He joins our panel with a keen passion for renewable energy for public health. Please help me in welcoming Mohammed, please go ahead and turn on your camera and say hello to our audience. Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, thank you. Thanks Mohammed. I'd like to next introduce Philip Egboka, who is a GIS and renewable energy expert with Integration Consulting Group. Philip is a geodata expert with a strong passion for GIS as a tool for data analysis. He is interested in humanitarian and social development projects that impact livelihood and target climate action. 
Philip has relevant working experience in the renewable energy sector. He's been involved in several World Bank and GIZ funded assignments with proven competence in the development of technical concepts for data-driven energy planning, applying technical skills and performing geospatial analysis, assisting in the development process of many grid projects and training relevant partners and stakeholders. Please join me in welcoming Philip. Philip, you can turn on your camera and introduce yourself to our audience. And say hello to our audience. Uh, hello everyone, greetings and uh, thanks to eHealth Africa for the opportunity. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. And last, but certainly not least, we have Yunisa Madugu, who is the Assistant Chief Data Officer at the National Primary Healthcare Data Agency in Nigeria. Yunisa is a data officer with over 20 years of experience. He is a proficient spatial information management specialist with an extensive background in results-driven analysis with a proven track record in data collection design database design to support applications and systems supporting mobile web-based and data visualization across different programs and projects. He is a GIS specialist focal person for NPHCDA, which uses advanced technical skills in GIS and database processes. He brings a wealth of experience and has numerous certifications in both ICT and GIS. Please join me in welcoming Yunusa. Yunusa, please turn on your camera and say hello to our audience. Hello, am I audible? Good afternoon, yes. everyone. So it is a welcome development for us to be here in present for the energy renewal. So thank you. So um, thank you for this moment. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Nisi, you're welcome. The SE for All initiative aims to double the global rate of energy efficiency and use of renewable energy. In the SE for All community energy access agenda, it notes that healthcare facilities are a special focus. Work has already begun to define measurable access targets for electricity, one of the most widely used forms of energy in health services. Without access to clean modern energy, it is impossible to achieve the sustainable development goals to reduce poverty, broaden education, and improve public health. There is an urgent need for reliable data that could be used to inform decisions on access to energy, especially in health facilities in developing countries. The goal of this webinar is to share various experiences that can exist all relevant stakeholders and industry players to utilize the data available to address the challenges of lack of access and intermittent and epi epileptic power supply in primary healthcare centers. We at eHealth Africa hope that this webinar will also trigger further discussions regarding a sustainable solution to the problem of power in primary healthcare centers, as well as identifying funding opportunities. This highly insightful event will last for one hour. We expect to have a robust discussion and there will also be opportunities for questions throughout our discussion um, and then after when we open it up for a Q&A to our audience. So please feel free throughout the session to send a message on the chat. We will get to your questions thereafter. So I'm gonna kick it off to our panelists. And our first question is actually going to go to Yunisa from um, our NPHCDA. And our question for you, Mr. Yunusa, is you've managed data, including that of primary healthcare centers in Nigeria. But what do you think are the critical challenges that primary healthcare centers have faced so far? And how have you in your work have been able to manage these challenges? Please feel free to turn on your mic and your, and your camera and take it away. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. So, am I audible? Yeah, yes, actually, yeah. managing a primary healthcare has been a, a long way. So, we started the, for a long time, almost 20 years plus, and we are still working on it to ensure we have a consolidated a, a remotely data center. I think EHEL was part of the development partners who are working towards it. Now they have started with EMIT applications. 
So actually, we have a centralized database for all operational departments. As I've said, operational department, we have different departments, which all the data has been segmented in each of the departments. So we are still working on it. We a part of the development partner. We have the Drifto, we have UNICEF and other partners who are always part of our partners to support us. So uh, actually, we have, you know, we manage almost 25,000 health facilities in Nigeria, as those that are conducting RI. You know, we have more than 30,000 health facilities, but those that are conducting RI, there are 25,000 plus right now ongoing. So we still have some challenges, as I've said. One, we need to have a central domain again because some of our remote temperature monitoring device, which is remotely, we have already a, a beyond wireless from South Africa. We have a, a backlog from a B medical from European countries. Then we have a control, which was at this uh, came through the e here. So we are trying to make a single domain to host this. Uh, remote temperature monitoring device, so we can, we can, we can monitor it uh, at least one domain, because right now we have three domains, so we need to sync it to ensure we monitor this domain centrally. So the database, we have uh, all the PSCs already. We have all the database we are monitoring. We have uh, deployed a lot of uh, tools like uh, GIS. We are uh, seeing some uh, visualization at some of the facility remotely. So as I've said, we have data that is unique now to speak since uh, we work with all the development partners for long term, almost 10 years plus. And we are already working towards it to ensure that this, this administrator, uh, the uh, our executive director and the ministers are working towards to have a unified central uh, data center for the agency. So thank you. Thank you, Unisa, and thank you for highlighting the importance of partnerships uh, in, in this effort, as well as the need for a central domain. I'm going to kick it off our next question to the team at integration. And my question is, looking at your profile, what problems do you identify that catch your attention that, you, that we should start working on when it comes to renewable energy solutions in countries with a lack of access to power? like Nigeria. And, and Philip, I think you can take this, or Frankie, you can take this. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, um, Sylvia, for that question. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, we have all either seen, heard, or uh, felt the effects of climate change in our immediate environment and in the world at large. And um, it's really important that nations come together and play their part in the climate action to mitigate these negative effects and uh, this includes a shift or a transition to renewables. And so in countries like Nigeria, deficiency in access to power stems from several challenges, including the cost of grid extension to um, distant or isolated settlements or um, communities and uh, inability to recuperate investments in the long term. So resorting to other technologies such as uh, renewables have proven cost effective in ensuring consistent and reliable energy supplies. Uh, secondly, natural resources, as we know, in most parts of Nigeria remain untapped. And uh, these are both environmentally and economically viable to tackle the lack of access to power. So um, basically encouraging the transition to clean uh, sources of energy generation contributes to climate action and also tries to ensure um, sustainability in the electrification process. Uh, I think my colleague Frankie also has a couple of points here to add. So I'll pass it yeah, to thanks, Philip. Um, yeah, maybe just to, to add on what Philip said, um, drawing upon our experience at, at Integration Environment Energy, um, we have a lot of, uh, well, a lot of experience with decentralized renewable energy technology. Um, so that would be, for example, hydroelectric or, or solar systems. Um, and in the specific form of um, a mini grid, so that's um, a decentralized technology um, powering an individual community. Um, so traditionally that would be focused um, on off-grid communities. So those communities which um, do not have a grid connection. Um, but we're seeing um, more interest in um, 
in connecting to communities that maybe have a weak grid um, or maybe installed grid infrastructure already, um, which, which then installing the, the, the renewable energy there provides an additional benefit of strengthening the grid. Um, so these are known as interconnected mini grids. And in terms of maybe specific challenges in that area, I just wanted to, to give an example of one of those. Um, so, so with the interconnected mini grid, we also um, there's also a requirement to interact with with a third stakeholder that would be and the, the distribution company in this case. Um, and yeah, just as an example, when you therefore combine more stakeholders, often it can result that projects become a bit more challenging to implement. Yeah, thanks, Sylvia. Thank you both, Philip and Frankie. I think we could all benefit from some of the points that you raised as far as how we've all been affected by climate change and the need to turn towards renewable energy. I think the key point that is raised when people think about renewable energy, thinking, oh, it's going to be costly in the environments in which we work. But it's good to know that you guys have had experience in, 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 in noting that renewable energy can be cost effective. Um, I also like the fact that you highlighted the challenges that could be faced when implementing certain projects, incorporating all stakeholders and the views of all stakeholders and mitigating those the, the, the challenges that brings up by having to work with multiple parties. Um, I will save the questions. I'm sure our audience will have a lot of questions for you, um, both on your experience working with various solutions. And I'll turn our next question over actually to our project manager, Mohamed Bello. Um, Mohammed, as a program, as a project manager in eHealth Africa, managing health-related projects, what is your experience regarding energy access in primary healthcare centers in Nigeria? Um, all right, thank you, Sylvia. So, as a data-driven organization uh, at eHealth Africa, we have implemented several health system strengthening projects. Uh, in Nigeria, like uh, the vaccine direct delivery projects, uh, physical stock count audit of vaccine uh, related commodities, uh, the grid tree project, the uh, vaccinator tracking project, uh, EOC, um, et cetera. So let me explain uh, briefly about this project that I just mentioned. Uh, starting with the vaccine direct delivery, uh, which is VDD, this project is about uh, delivering life saving vaccines to last mile health facilities. The project was implemented in Canada. Uh, Bauchi, Sokoto, and State, cumulatively delivering over 42 million full tent vaccines across over 700 cold chain equipped uh, last mile health facilities, health facilities at world level and LGA cost tools. So um, uh, talking about the next project is uh, that I just mentioned is the physical stock count audit of vaccine or related commodities. The project was about uh, delivering and uh, undertaking uh, the inventory stock count exercise of vaccines or related commodities at government and health facilities in Northwest Nigeria. And the assessment was conducted in 2018 in over 1,500 health facilities and hostels across uh, seven states uh, of the Northwest, talking about Jigawa, Kaduna, Kano, Kazina, Kebi, Sokoto, and Zampara states. Uh, the next project is GRID 3. Uh, GRID stands for uh, Georeference Infrastructure and Demographic Data for Development. The GRID 3 project aimed to collect accurate and complete geospatially referenced data relevant to a variety of sectors across Nigeria, including the energy as well as the health sector. Um, uh, data set collected include uh, settlements and point of interest, uh, point of interest like uh, the health facilities, schools, market, uh, roads, etc. Uh, and another project that uh, we've implemented in eHealth Africa um, is a vaccinatory tracking project, uh, which is VTS. It stands uh, for vaccinatory tracking system. And the project was introduced to support the effort of the Nigerian government uh, and uh, partner agencies towards the elimination of polio virus transmission and achieving uh, polio free uh, certification. VTS uses data collected during immunization plus this campaign to identify um, miss and partially covered settlements to improve vaccination geo coverage uh, and in high risk states uh, of Nigeria. The project was implemented in 32 states uh, of the country. Uh, another project is the EOC. Uh, we also support public health sector in building um, infrastructure for an emergency response. On this, we build the, the emergency operation centers across seven states and the LCT. 
Uh, the EOCs are simply just government-led initiatives with the aim of improving information sharing as well as joint programming. And that's planning, uh, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of projects. Uh, all these towards improve public health emergency response. So um, now um, across and many other projects we implemented in the country, and this has exposed us firsthand to the urgency and needs for a solution to the unreliable and lack of power to most of the health facilities in the country. So now let me uh, talk uh, directly about uh, the primary health centers. There are over 39 operational hospitals and clinics in Nigeria. And um, most of these health facilities are PHCs that are located in rural communities and poor settlements. They usually close uh, by 5 p.m. at the latest, mostly due to lack of power, prompting those residents in those areas to travel far at night for medical treatment. According to a survey um, conducted by Budget IT in FCT in 2017, revealed that uh, the lack of appropriate uh, hospital equipment and surprisingly access to reliable energy supply were the leading barriers to improve healthcare delivery in Nigeria. Other barriers listed in the survey were the low drug availability, lack of access to clean water, lack of functional laboratory, and lack of uh, laboratory equipment poor physical uh, infrastructure of the PHCs, non-conducive uh, work environment, lack of automobile, ambulance and motorcycle, and minimal or non-existent of staff training. And most of these barriers that I just mentioned, talking about the lack of access to clean water, drug storage, functional laboratory, conducive work environment, and working infrastructure, et cetera, places access to steady electricity as central. So, um, um, looking at this, uh, therefore, one would agree that without a reliable energy supply, the following will not function properly. Uh, talking about the low uh, laboratory equipment, pumping machine for the supply of water for the hospital, elimination and cooling for the PHCs and drugs uh, and vaccine cannot be uh, definitely uh, stored properly. And with the reality of the global warming caused by climate change, as uh, mentioned by uh, by if I need, the hospital work environment will not definitely will not be conducive without the availability of clean and steady energy. So uh, according to World Health Organization and WHO, um, uh, standard operating procedures for most hospitals require energy use for water supply, temperature control, lighting, ventilation, and clinical processes. Undoubtedly, unreliable electricity uh, access in primary health centers leads to lack of portable water, vaccine storage, interruption in the use of essential medical and diagnostic devices, and uh, a lack of even the most basic lighting and uh, communication for maternal delivery and emergency procedures. Uh, thank you, uh, Sylvia. Back to you. Wow, wow. Thank you, Mohammed Bello, and thank you for doing such a great job of painting an accurate picture of what's actually happening in the primary health care facilities and how um, the lack of power um, and, and, and just a few minutes, because I'd like to hear more about what eHealth Africa is actually doing uh, to bridge the gap in those primary health care centers, but I'll come back. Um, I want to kick it off to um, our colleague at the NPHCDA, Mr. Yunus, and I want you to talk a little bit about how you feel like reliable data uh, informs decision making in tackling the power challenges at the primary health care centers. Um, and, and are you confident that renewable energy uh, is, is, you know, with the sustainability plan is the way, is, is the solution, is the answer, it will actually address uh, the lack of energy access in PHCs. So uh, those are that's a twofold question, but you know, if you can take that from us, that would be great. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. I I want to respond to your question on the the challenges, some of the challenges we face in improving the health facilities. So we find out that the one uh, we have issue in maintenance of the generator. And you know, in this country, we don't have power supply 24 hours or even 10 hours in some states. So some only five, three hours. So we have these challenges. Now, to improve the healthcare facility, one, we need to address the clean energy, which is the renewable energy already in pipeline. So, and, and thirdly, 
the laboratory services that are conducted at the lowest level, which is the primary health care services, are not, there's no buy-in from the community because they are fear because of lack of electricity, they move to the private health facilities, uh, private laboratory uh, uh, services to conduct their laboratory, which is uh, another challenge that we are facing in this country. So to, you can see the analysis we conducted even last, last two months, the delivery which is a uh, antenatal care, you can see a patients, almost uh, patients attended uh, antenatal, they have already a rapport that uh, they can do the antenatal health care at the health facilities, but they cannot deliver there because there's no electricity. So you can see that some analysis in Niger said, antenatal health care, antenatal health care attendance 700 in three months. But those that deliver within three months are just 20 out of that. So it means some, they, they, they have passion to go to the health facility to, to attend for antenatal care, but they don't have, uh, they, they have fear in delivery because there's no access, there's no uh, laboratory test conducted, and there's no lighting. So that's why mostly they deliver at the private health facilities. So these are some of the challenges we are facing in the NPSCJ. Now, for, we still have, uh, again, I need to at least have uh, ensure that if the electricity, the renewable energy would at least provide our uh, health facilities with the renewable energy, there will be a ton of of antenatal health care and the delivery, at least a massive health facility. But secondly, again, the challenge I will face in the, the, the solarized electric, electricity is that we need, I need to have a unified monitoring system. Monitoring system in the sense that I can view, visualize all the health facility. Let's say 10,000 health facility, I can visualize whether they have electricity, or not at least whether they have a, at least a, a power failure from the either from the panel or whatsoever. If we can have that device at our national, so that we can trigger within the ambit of the service level agreement and within so, so months, at least uh, in solar, we ensure that we have taken care if there's a payload within the ambit of their obligation. And if it's the obligation of the government, so then we need to at least address that issue. So if we, if we have the electricity without us see visualization remotely at the health facilities, means there will be an issue. We, if we take it in ensure that the health facility in charge will be triggered if there's a challenges, some of them will not trigger. And the issue we face in some of our vendors is that uh, when the facility call them, they, 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 they don't respond in time. So these are the, some of the challenges, again, we are facing with some uh, remote, uh, remote uh, visualization within our, because as I've said, we have almost three devices, the RTMD, so we visualize at time we still have challenges with the service level uh, yes, uh, agreement. So that's the challenge we face. Thank you, over. Thank you, Nusa. Thank you for highlighting some of the challenges as well as your support for seeing renewable energy as the solution for addressing some of those challenges. I think it'd be great right now for us to hear from Frankie from integration because you've worked in this space. You know, what capacities can you, based on the challenges that Unisa just described, um, what capacities do you believe renewable energy has in addressing some of the power challenges in the primary healthcare centers? Um, you know, can you, can you speak to that? And yeah, thanks for the question, Sylvia. Um, so, so yeah, I wanted to maybe first go back and explain a little bit, maybe different renewable energy solutions. Um, since I know a large the audience is largely from the healthcare, so maybe it's good to just summarize these. Um, so, so maybe I could roughly put it into three main categories. Um, the first um, or like largest category would be um, maybe on grid. Um, on grid uh, renewable energies, for example, a very large solar plant connected to the grid or large scale hydro, um, which is yeah one of the uh, key um, yeah contributors to the energy mix. Um, then maybe a step smaller, as I spoke before about mini grids, empowering um, maybe a, a community. Um, and then finally on the small scale would be such as standalone systems, maybe one solar panel on the roof um, which is often seen also in in um, in healthcare facilities. Um, so, 
So yeah, maybe I would uh, focus a little bit again on mini grids, just because that's where my uh, experience would was mostly lie. Um, so for example, with with connecting the primary uh, health center to the to the mini grid, one requirement, a technical requirement, is that it should not be too far away from the community. So so about 500 uh, meters, no more than a kilometer, definitely, um, if you're connecting with low voltage. Um, so, so that can sometimes be maybe a constraint on being able to connect the facility to the, to the mini grid. Um, and yeah, also speaking maybe to, to a project that I know Sylvia um, knows, um, which I worked out in my previous um, employer before I joined integration. Um, and that is um, a mini grid um, program in Sierra Leone. It's funded by uh, DFID and implemented by UNOPS. And I think here it's it was um, it's quite special because the the focus is on supplying power to the health center and then the community as as kind of a secondary. Um, so so the power system is installed very near to the health center. Um, can that can provide also some benefit because. Sometimes there could be a challenge in finding land to install install the solar system. So already that that could provide maybe a, a synergy, so to say. Um, and also the health center then had a priority power supply. So so that's also another benefit in in being you know based first around the health center and then extending that out to the community. Um, yeah, I would hand over to Philip. I think he has a few words to add um, onto this uh, question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Frankie. And I would just uh, like to pick up from your point about these categories, um, mainly focusing on the uh, mini grids as um, a source of um, um, renewable electrification. Uh, so when running a mini grid, it's actually important that um, uh, it's important to consider an inclusive social enterprise model. And uh, in this situation, or in this scenario, rather, uh, the mini grid is um, self-sustainable. Uh, promoting energy usage and also economic development. So basically in this approach, um, the mini grid supplies not just the households, regular households and um, irregular day-to-day -day consumers within the communities, but it also supplies large consumers of electricity, such as these primary healthcare centers. Um, the benefit in this is um, it generates greater socioeconomic um, benefit for the community while ensuring um, available financing for technical upkeep of the mini grid. So this is, it sort of brings up a win-win situation um, for both the large users, such as the primary healthcare centers, which um, I think the former speaker Mohammed mentioned that they need um, the, the necessity for constant electricity supply to power um, various equipment within these um, facilities. Um, so yeah, it's it's a win-win situation because now they have reliable electricity supply, and it's also a win for the mini grid operator who is now able to meet the financial targets that are necessary for the mini grid maintenance. And then also to add to that, healthcare centers that are located in communities um, with uh, interconnected mini grids can also benefit a lot by eliminating the downtime from the weak supply of um, you know, the, the regular grid. Uh, with the mini grid as a backup, there is, is, it's possible to ensure consistent supply. And this can in turn lead to the reduction in loss of lives due to blackouts during complex medical procedures. Uh, thanks, now I'll hand it back to you, Sylvia. Thank you both, Philip and Frankie from Integration. I really appreciate it. Um, providing more detail about how the mini grid works and how it benefits not only um, the community, but also the primary healthcare centers and how it's mutually beneficial if they uh, are both are part and connected to the mini grid um, and, and just the social enterprise model. I think that's really beneficial and helpful um, for our audience. I'm sure they'll have questions. And, and, and just a reminder to everyone, you can drop your questions before we get to the question and answer se se section. You can choose your Q&A option um, and drop your question in the chat or drop it in the Q&A section and we'll get to it um, at the end of our discussion with our panelists. Um, my next question is actually for um, our project manager, Mohamed Bello. And um, I want him to kind of talk about what eHealth Africa has actually done, the kind of projects we've embarked upon um, and what we're doing to actually bridge um, this energy access you know, in healthcare facilities, this gap in energy. Um, if you can speak a little bit to that, that would be great. Thanks. 
All right, uh, thank you, Sylvia. So for the past decade, uh, eHealth Africa is a non-governmental organization uh, leading the utilization of technology for public health uh, project implementation. Uh, has worked in Nigeria and Sierra Leone uh, with resource capacity and strategic partnerships on implemented programs and projects in countries like Cameroon, Chad, uh, Democratic Republic uh, of the Congo, uh, Mali, Niger Republic, Liberia, South Sudan, and Somalia. So uh, EALT Africa utilizes its GIS expertise and experience and implemented uh, the three project uh, that I highlighted earlier, uh, where we map all the 36 states uh, plus FCT by collecting all point of interest, which include the uh, health facilities, thereby building a reliable geospatial data repository for healthcare facilities. Uh, this means that uh, the health facilities in Nigeria are on the map. So, uh, which is one of the first steps in understanding where power is needed. And this data is accessible to all for non-commercial use on the grid tree website, as well as uh, our EHG data portal. So you can download this data on our data portal. At the same time, you can even generate uh, maps. Recently, uh, we validated some of this data through an energy survey, which is part of the Nigeria Energy Support Program too, uh, together with the integration team that's frankly came uh, across three states namely Kano, Oshun, and Nasra State, uh, to know the energy status of those health facilities. The survey was conducted across over 600 health facilities. And the findings uh, from this survey are revealed that uh, over 50% of the health facilities lack access to energy, and about 20% have minimal access to electricity, which is just uh, less than six hours daily, as uh, mentioned by UNOSA. So we are working with our partners to illuminate and, uh, and bridge the gap in terms of providing data that will uh, inform decisions as regard energy access in primary healthcare centers in Nigeria. Um, uh, with the constant uh, projective power supply, bedeviling the public healthcare facilities and with our experience as an organization, uh, within the public health space, uh, we saw an urgent need to change the status quo by introducing clean, reliable, affordable, and sustainable energy for better healthcare delivery in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Could you speak a little bit about more about the innovation solution that addresses the challenges? Could you provide any details about what those solutions were? Mohammed, you're on mute. Okay, yeah, thank you. So I'm excited about this question because my teams are working on a renewable energy modular solution. Um, EAT Africa's approach is to deploy its modular solution that involves the design and implementation of renewable energy solutions uh, for healthcare uh, facilities in especially low resource settings uh, like um, uh, our country, Nigeria, uh, which talking about those health facilities that I mentioned earlier, they are mostly in uh, remote locations. So we are calling it re 4 fee solar system. This is our modular solution. The system is designed to be deployed to tier zero and tier one health facilities according to the WHO multi-tier framework for rating health facilities access to power. Uh, tier zero, we are talking about health facilities with no access to power, and uh, tier one are health facilities with minimal access to power. The RE4PH modular system is designed to provide a 5 kBA solar power system that has an annual output yield of about 12,000 kilowatt and a reduction in CO2 emission by uh, over 6,000 per year. I uh, believe this is enough to fulfill all the energy requirements of an Apex Health Facility per Nigeria's minimum service package of primary health care facilities by MPSTDA. The goal is to increase um, the access to power for last mile health facilities, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Our re 4 ph mode solar system is affordable and reliable. Yeah, so uh, in addition, an energy audit uh, is one of the prerequisite considerations uh, before we deploy our re 4 ph solar system. Uh, triangulation of the energy audit and your special data allow us to have an even further insight into the energy requirement of PHCs before deployment. So uh, leveraging existing geospatial data at our disposal, we use that uh, to identify and locate our facilities to conduct the energy audit. 
And the main purpose of this audit is to know the energy demand of those health facilities. Uh, that is to understand their load profile and the total energy capacity needed for each health center. During this informs our, our design and deployment strategy for the area for BH uh, um, uh, solar system um, uh, for a PSC uh, requirement. Uh, further, um, uh, the, uh, this, um, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, further tailoring the system to uh, local needs. Uh, so, uh, uh, next is the deployment of uh, the renewable energy solution. Uh, just to, I would like to set an example here uh, before we continue. Yeah, in 2020, EHA conducted an energy audit across eight EUCs that I mentioned earlier, uh, and we deployed a renewable energy modular solution in six out of those eight EUCs we built in Nigeria and installed an off grid of 30 kVA uh, uh, to address the problem of erratic power supply uh, facing those uh, emergency operations centers. The remaining two of those uh, Kano and FCT was hybrid solution due to their capacity. So we deployed the same renewable energy uh, solution in some African countries like uh, Uganda, Zambia, on the, another project that we are currently implementing in uh, um, African countries, uh, the polio outbreak control room. Currently, our team is uh, still working on deploying uh, this uh, off-grid uh, installation solution in seven states in Somalia. So uh, we are talking about sustainable energy for improved uh, healthcare delivery in Nigeria. We do not leave it like that. We have a proposed sustainability plan for our Aribo PH solar system. So right from the installation stage, uh, personnel of uh, the health facility should be identified to work together with our technical team to understand the process and to build their capacity to handle operations and maintenance. That's who I am. Of course, for the O&M uh, Aribo PH solar system, funds are needed. And this could be incorporated into the basic healthcare formation fund uh, coming uh, from the federal authority to the state. Uh, this way, state primary healthcare agencies uh, doesn't have to go back to the federal authority or you don't know for O&M funds uh, again. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Mohamed Bello. Some great work being done in the space. I think you've highlighted very well. And I, I like how you ended it on the funding note, because that leads me, I guess, to my final question before I'll take final statements from our panelists. My final question is, um, and this is to anyone, but more so to integration, because I think you, you guys have been working in this space for a while. Are there funding opportunities that are provided for renewable energy solutions for primary healthcare centers in Nigeria and, 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 and elsewhere? Are there funding opportunities? Are people interested in this to fund uh, these solutions? Uh, yeah, thanks again, Sylvia, for, Sylvia, for the question. Um, yes, there are several funding opportunities. And uh, these exist through various federal government and uh, international organization collaborations. Um, following the COVID-19 pandemic, several earlier energy access programs have actually evolved as uh, energizing healthcare programs, either solely or as an addition to their main objectives. Uh, notably, the Rural Electrification Agency provided a round of grants uh, for the rollout of decentralized renewable energy solutions to power healthcare uh, facilities. Um, another organization doing some interesting um, work is the USAID, as they are funding uh, the Power Africa Nigeria Power Sector program. Uh, this is a program providing technical assistance to the Royal Electrification Agency on this. Um, also, the uh, SE for All initiative and the Henrich All Foundation have also conduct, conducted uh, market studies on energizing healthcare uh, centers with um, distributed renewable energy, um, especially solar PV in particular. Uh, apart from the Rural Electrification Agency program on energizing healthcare, there aren't really other programs dedicated solely to um, energizing healthcare in the country. However, uh, within existing uh, programs, the additionality of um, energizing healthcare system is greatly considered. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you for that. I want to 
give our panelists, I don't know if there are any final statements before we kick it off to our audience for questions. Um, any final statements, statements that anyone wants to cover? Yunusa, I'll, I'll allow you if there's any final statements um, before we kick it to our audience. Uh, you could start first. Yes, uh, should I go ahead or should we wait for others? No, please, it's the mic, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you for that, Sylvia. I think there is a lot of a, a question to address. To, uh, I think to me, if the renewal energy keep off for the health facilities, there must be a lot of buy-in because one, we started with the solar direct drive when we started in Nigeria. People thought that we cannot manage it but because of the remote temperature monitoring device, which we are monitoring visibility from our national to the health facility, it is functional or not functional. And if it's not functional, then we call, we find out what is the issue, then we call our service uh, uh, vendors to address that at that particular stage. So fine. So from there, before they left government to be green, now you can, a lot of states are buying the solar direct drive. Even some state politicians are buying the solar direct drive. So it means there's a lot of buying. Now, if we deploy the solar energy, it means there must be a remote monitoring device because here at the national to ensure that all the 10,000 facilities we are monitoring weekly, we are doing a report, we are presenting at the national, then we are sent to do their obligation. They have their login user, they can present it. If there's a, a issue, maybe in kind, in a kind of maybe a thunder arrest or maybe there's a kind of a fire outbreak, we can resolve that within a minimum uh, publication that we have. But if there's no monitoring device of that, because I knew that technologies, everyday technology keep developing, so we can do that a monitoring device, so can we, we monitor the solar at all level. When there's an issue, there's a world development committee at the world level who they can address some issue within their obligations. There are some issues that we can address at the national to ensure we call for the vendors to come and check why this, uh, uh, and facility is not powered. We have seen that there's a downtime between social and social time. So we need, if we have this, it means there will must be a lot of buy-in in the country. So thank you, and over. Thank you, Nusa, for that. I mean, I think it's key. He stressed on the, the fact that there needs to be buy-in. And then also at the central level, they need to be able to monitor what's happening uh, 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 across across the states. And I think that that's key. Thank you, Unisa. Um, are there any other closing statements from any of our panelists before we kick it off to our audience? Uh, integration, do you have any final statements? Or should we go ahead and go to the audience or Mohammed, anyone? Yeah. Maybe I can just quickly say, yeah, I really love the point about uh, needing to remotely monitor um, systems to ensure that they continue to work. And um, maybe just to, to say that I think to, um, yeah, we, there's maybe not one, um, technical solution for for renewable energy for for health healthcare, um, and that it needs to incorporate lots of different technologies, both small and large on grid technologies. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Frankie. Mohammed or Philip, anything? Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to say, being today is the Universal World Health Care Coverage Day. Uh, it is. I uh, would like to just uh, call on the uh, the donor agencies to utilize this medium and government uh, to double uh, effort towards uh, uh, provision of sustainable energy for PHCs. At uh, this, uh, definitely, I'm confident that uh, with this, uh, we can be able to achieve the universal health coverage uh, of the United Nations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed. Philip? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to contribute by saying that um, as a country in Nigeria, we've come a long way to um, uh, this whole um, drive of the transformation or energy transformation to renewables. Uh, we've done a lot, but a lot still needs to be done. And uh, at least we're in the right path. So yeah, it's good to know that we're heading in the right direction. Great, thank you for that. Thank you both. So before we close, we would like to allow our audience to ask our panelists any questions they may have. If you have questions, it would be great if you use the Q&A icon on your screen. Um, and so we will open it up. I have two questions that I saw before 
uh, oh, four have come in. Okay, great. So we'll start it off. And, and this could go, if you have a specific question for one of the panelists, please name the panelists. Um, otherwise, I'm going to leave it open for any panelists to answer. Um, first question is, what steps are being taken to mitigate bureaucracy and increase acceptance between the stakeholders, government, and primary health care for maximum effect? And um, it sounds like that question is targeted towards UNISA, um, but if anyone else has an answer, um, that's fine. So it's what steps are being taken to mitigate bureaucracy and increase acceptance? UNISA, do you want to take that? Uh, I think, yes. Uh, let, let me say something on the bureaucracy in Nigeria. You know, we, the, health facility, the health facility was owned by the state, while some owned by the community. So it depends on the, and there's a bureaucracy within the government themselves. At the state level, you can see one, Commission of Health does not have say on the primary health care except the ES executive secretary, who are under the governor again, has said on the primary health care. You see, between, within the staff, they still have challenges between the Commission of Health and the executive secretary of primary health care. All of them were, were at least uh, employed by the state government. Now, we, the, primary, uh, the national primary health care service, we have our own obligation at the health facilities. So we don't have 100% say 100% ownership to handle that health facilities because it's owned by the state. What we do, we put the, we push the community with them and we are monitoring our community, especially the vaccines, some of the hospital equipment we procure at the national and then deploy to the health facilities. But for us to have that kind to break some of the challenges we face with the state, unless the government has to pull all the primary health care facilities to the federal government, which is the national primary health care facility. Now, once we have full autonomy on the state primary, uh, primary health care board, it means we don't have the bureaucracy to address themselves at that level. So that's the challenge we are facing. And again, we try to hold this primary health care board. The state government say no. They want to handle their budget. Then they want to do what they are, what, what they want to do at their obligation within themselves. So that's at the sum of the challenge we are facing at the primary health care. But you can say ask any. That any health facility have their vaccine. We deploy vaccine, we deploy all the solar direct drive to ensure we power all these facilities with the solar vaccine. Now, as I'm telling you now, we have one functional health facilities that has a solar direct drive per each ward in Nigeria. While we have 9,600 and something watts, we have power it. But the challenges. Is the management of the health facility who are owned by the ES. ES only answerable to government, not even to the Commission of Health at the state. So these are the bureaucrats. So thank you, over. Thank you. Thank you, Unisa. Thank you for taking that on. I know it's a tough question. Um, our next question, and I'll try my best. We may not get to all unless we go over time, but I'll try my best. The next question, Mohammed, you have two questions, but I'm only going to do the second one. Um, the, it's about what are the main barriers against implementing a renewable energy system or energy project? And I think this could go to integration or Mohammed Bello. Uh, you know, what are the main barriers you faced? Uh, implementing renewable energy systems. I know that Frankie talked about, you know, working with various stakeholders, um, but can anyone else shed some light on that? Okay, maybe I can start and then I invite uh, Mohamed, Bello and Philip to, to add on. Um, I think one in terms of mini grids, one important aspect is um, funds and therefore ensuring um, affordable tariffs in the systems. Um, because oftentimes it is more expensive than than grid tariff and and yeah it needs to be affordable of course or else it's it's not going to be beneficial to anybody yeah anyone else want to talk about barriers they face if not i'll go into because when you talked about being affordable there's this there's a question from justice that talks about um how do we ensure that these energy sources are adequately maintained and not left to deteriorate over time um, I think that's a concern of, of, of anyone that wants to implement any form of renewable energy solution. So maintenance, you know, how do we avoid it being deteriorated? Anyone want to speak to that? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Thank you, uh, Sylvia. 
Um, so talking about uh, still on these various, uh, I think uh, uh, one largely is the funding, and uh, uh, the second one is the funding uh, area with funding and uh, is possible. And uh, um, I'm happy uh, with uh, now we 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 have uh, we begin to see uh, availability of data that will inform decisions uh, for uh, uh, for the authorities, the uh, government and many agencies to understand that uh, this is cost effective, as Frankie. Uh, mentioned is cost effective is affordable and uh, it's something that uh, if we go for it have uh, a lot of benefit and uh, um, uh, we uh, we mentioned those benefit uh, again uh, a lot and uh, the other the other thing I uh, is the is the one uh, definitely there is a need for building capacity of uh, personnel taking care of uh, this uh, to take care of the one m so with that I think um, we can be able to address uh, these barriers and uh, our funders uh, government and donor agencies is, can be confident and say yes. Uh, we we have installed this uh, renewable energy solution, and uh, we see that it has been maintained for quite a long period of time without getting uh, damaged. Uh, so over. Thank you. Okay, um, another good question, and I see the questions are just coming in. And I'm getting nervous that we're not going to be able to get to all of them. This is a great question. I mean, we're all here to learn. Someone's asking, is solar energy the only source of renewable energy targeted? Is there, are there any other renewable energy technology in consideration? They're asking about microorganisms, driving energy, hydro energy, and so on. Does anyone have any knowledge with relation to the other sources of energy, you know, renewable energy that exists? Anyone want to speak to that? I know that, you know, Frankie talked about the microgrid, um, but yeah, does anyone want to talk about any of the other sources? Yeah. Mohammed or Philip? <laughs> Yeah, so maybe I'll go ahead and uh, speak to this. Um, yes, there are some other sources. Um, like you already mentioned here, we have um, hydro um, mini grids as a source for renewables, um, followed by, um, we also have the wind, uh, wind farms as a source of renewables, but these are not um, really implemented within the country yet. Um, so one of the main um, sources that I've really mostly implemented within um, Nigeria is mostly the hydro and then the solar as well. But yeah, there's uh, a lot of other sources for renewables as well, beyond just these. Great, thank you, Philip. Um, lots of questions about sustainability of the solutions. I think we spoke a little bit about that. Um, um, do we think that renewable energy is going to spread across PhDs in Nigeria or some specific region in the geopolitical zones in Nigeria? Um, okay, this is another other, other good one about vendors um, and their products not being satisfying. Um, is there any advice for, uh, you know, people, I guess vendors come out and put like these products, but they're not, I guess, of quality, is there any advice on how we can mitigate that or manage that? And then I'll probably have to close out uh, on the number of questions so that we can close and keep to time. Um, anyone wanna speak to the quality of products that different vendors put out when it comes to renewable energy solutions? Okay, all right. Okay, so we are at time. Um, and I, I just want to conclude with just restating that the access to energy, um, it's a prerequisite for quality health care, and it's, it's fundamental to the achievement of universal health coverage um, in, this, in the SDG goals. Lack of sufficient and reliable power is jeopardizing the well-being of hundreds of millions of people, especially women and children who often bear the brunt of inadequate primary health care services. We need more successes like these that we've discussed today um, if we are going to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals around health and energy. I wanna thank you again. I wanna say thank you <laughs> to our panelists um, and our audience for taking the time to attend this webinar. Our next insights um, is going to be held in January. It will be held on January 25th in 2023. We wish everyone here a happy end to your 2022, and we wish you a successful beginning in the new year um, in 2023. 
But before you log off, we want you to take the time out to fill out the survey um, that shows up when you end the webinar. Uh, we'd like to see your feedback and we hope to uh, see you again uh, in 2023. Your questions will be noted. We'll see if we can find a way to get some of these answers for some of our, from, from some of our experts, um, but we do wanna keep to time because we know that your time is precious um, and valuable. Thank you for joining this discussion and we'll see you in the new year. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone, bye. Everyone.